Okay, thanks very much to the organizers for giving me a chance to talk about this. This work was in collaboration with Norbert Lukinghaus and Eric Medodiev. Uh, so you're probably wondering what I mean by unstructured here. Um, I did a uh, Google search for the word unstructured, unstructured and these images popped up. This is, looks like a protein losing its structure. But uh, in the context of QKD, uh, what I mean is the following. So, uh, we often rely on symmetry in QKD in order to simplify the calculation of key rates. Uh, for example, in BB84, the four states are related by a rotational uh, symmetry group, a rotation by 90 degrees. And likewise, there is a corresponding symmetry group for the six state protocol. And we, use, we rely on symmetry to help us analytically simplify the problem to determine the optimal eavesdropping attack. Uh, but, but what about um, protocols that, that don't have symmetry? Um, either intentionally or unintentionally. For example, what about, say, a discrete variable QKD protocol involving coherent states where your coherent states, say, are scattered about the phase plane like this? How would you go about calculating the key rate for a protocol like this? Uh, and my, so we argue that, um, that so lack of symmetry is more the rule rather than the exception because experimental imperfections naturally tend to break symmetries. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a means to investigate uh, unstructured protocols um, to even ask the question, like, how does so this unstructured protocol compare in performance to some structured protocol? So, we need uh, a new method for calculating key rates, and, and I would argue that we need numerics instead of analytics at this stage. So, so, basically, the vision that we have is that we would like to have a user-friendly software like this where you, the user, as are either experimentalist or theorist, come to us with um, your protocol of interest. You enter in the, um, the specifications of the protocol, uh, and we would output a key rate. So, for example, it would be something like this, uh, where Allison, you put input Allison Ball's measurement operators, um, the observed statistics for the measurement operators. Uh, perhaps you have a post-selection map in your protocol, like for sifting, and then you have a key map, and then we would output a key rate. So that's the vision that we're hoping to work towards. Um, but what's the machinery behind that? How do we actually calculate key rates? So uh, the key rate, as I'll show in a moment, is an optimization problem. Uh, the idea is we want to go from Alice and Bob's observations, so, so which correspond to a set of measurement operators represented by these uh, Hermitian observables and uh, their corresponding expectation values here. Um, and then you can uh, form a set of density operators that satisfy these constraints. Uh, and then you have to take the well-known formula, the Devatak winter formula for the key rate, and minimize it over all um, eavesdropping attacks that are consistent with your data. That is, all density operators, row AB, consistent with these constraints. And of course, the reason is that we have to be as pessimistic as possible. Um, so I just want to remark that uh, in this work, we, we only consider asymptotic key rates, but in future work, we're interested in, in extending this to finite key analysis. So, uh, so what's the problem with just directly computing this minimization? Well, if you have a supercomputer, then sure, go ahead, just go ahead and do it. But um, the problem is that if you want to do it on just a laptop, then it's, uh, you, you run into um, inefficiency in the sense that the, the number of parameters uh, that you have to optimize over scales with um, the dimension squared. That is, Alice's dimension times Bob's dimension squared. Uh, so if this calculation could take a very long time in higher dimensions, and uh, furthermore, it's, it's unreliable in the sense that uh, typically in QKD, you're interested in reliable lower bounds on the key rate, that is, physically achievable key rates. Uh, but the computer will spit out an upper bound when you do this, in the sense that, um, say, the computer doesn't exactly reach the global minimum, then whatever the computer spits out will be an upper bound on the, on the key rate. So, uh, and, but nonetheless, this approach has been used, for example, by Matsumoto, uh, and where he studied the B92 protocol. Um, but it's interesting to note that uh, there was a range of error rates for which his, his optimization didn't con converge. Um, and uh, I emphasize here that this is a very low dimensional system, and it doesn't get any lower dimensional than qubits. So if we're already running into trouble at qubits, just imagine the problems that we're going to have at higher dimensions. So uh, this motivates our approach, which is uh, to take the, the primal problem and to transform it into the dual problem. So it's known in optimization theory that there's something called the dual problem. And uh, the idea here is that we turn a minimization into a maximization. So instead of 
approaching the key rate from above, we approach it from below. And what's nice about that is that uh, every number that the computer spits out, even if it didn't reach the global maximum, will be a reliable lower bound on the key rate. Uh, and furthermore, um, what's also really nice is that the number of parameters in the dual problem we find is, is equal to the number of experimental constraints. And this can, in some cases, be uh, constant, uh, independent of dimension. So this can potentially scale very nicely with dimension. So uh, just to flash up my main result, um, actually, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back to the previous slide for a moment. Um, this, this function here that we find uh, depends on uh, the measurement operators uh, gamma, as well as their expectation values, and as well as the POVM elements that uh, Alice has used to generate her, uh, her key. And, uh, and it depends on these Lagrange multipliers, uh, lambda, which is or the things that you optimize over. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail about the form of our, our main result. I'm just going to say, see the archive uh, this week. Uh, but the way that I'll illustrate it is by looking at protocols first that have uh, known key rates. So we can take our main result and apply it to the B90, uh, BB84 protocol. And uh, the red curve here is the known theoretical dependence of the key rate on the error rate. Um, the blue dots are the result of our numerical optimization and should be viewed as reliable lower bounds on the key rate. But in this case, as you can see, they're perfectly tight. So that's very encouraging. And likewise, we get the same behavior for the six-state protocol. We exactly reproduce the known theoretical curve uh, with our numerical optimization. So moving on to higher dimensions, consider a uh, general, uh, generalization of the BB84 protocol involving two mutually unbiased bases, where Alice and Bob measure in one of two MEBs. Uh, and uh, I've shown here the curves for dimensions 6, 8, and 10. And uh, so as you can see, um, so the solid curves are the theory, and the circular dots are, are numerics. And we, once again, exactly reproduce the, the theory curves. Uh, but what's really interesting is if we compare this to the primal problem, in the primal problem, to, pr to produce these curves, we would have to optimize, um, for example, if d equals 10, we'd have to optimize over 10,000 parameters. But, uh, but in the dual problem, uh, we only have two parameters to optimize over, namely the Lagrange multipliers associated with the error rates in the two bases. So, so, so this is very nice. We get a dramatic simplification in terms of the number of parameters we have to optimize over. And in this sense, we believe our approach is ideally suited to higher dimensional systems. Uh, but now let's move on to finding new key rates. So, um, as I showed you previously, uh, it's known what the, what the theoretical uh, curves are for two MUBs. It's also known for D plus one MUBs, um, but there's a lot of white space in this table here that's unknown, namely bet between, if you consider protocols involving N MUBs, uh, where N is between two and D plus one. Uh, but with our numerics, we could fill in this table here. So uh, I, I just show you for uh, the example D equals five. Um, here's the known curves for n equals two mutually unbiased spaces and n equals six mutually unbiased spaces. So how does it um, interpolate between these two extremes? And here's, here's how it interpolates. So this is the result of our numerics. Um, and uh, we can see that the key rate gradually increases as we increase the number of mutually unbiased spaces. But what's interesting is that we get a big jump just going from two to three mutually unbiased spaces and then diminishing returns as you increase the number of MUBs. Uh, and just to make that more clear, I show the error tolerance versus the number of mutual unbiased spaces, and you see there's a big jump going from two to three and then diminishing returns here. Uh, so uh, we see a similar jump for other dimensions, even non-prime dimensions, um, and I'll just remark that there exists three MEBs in all dimensions, so it's just an interesting um, idea that perhaps you can just add one more basis to your protocol going from two to three and you get a big jump in the key rate. So uh, all the protocols that I've shown you thus far, we can actually, uh, for all those protocols, we can analytically prove that our numerical approach is um, exactly tight, uh, precisely tight for all these protocols. That is, our optimization exactly reproduces the primal optimization for these protocols involving MUBs. But of course, the point of this method is to move off of structure. And uh, so perhaps you don't have MUBs, but you have some um, arbitrary uh, measurements that you're doing. And, and for example, we consider a protocol where instead of measuring uh, Z and X, uh, Alice and Bob uh, either measure Z or W, where W is rotated by an angle theta away from the X axis. 
this allows us to compare our approach to um, an analytical, analytical method based on the entropic uncertainty relation. Uh, and I show, for example, what the key rate as a function of theta would be from the entropic uncertainty relation. Um, and uh, just for the special case where the error rate is 1%. Now we can compare this to our uh, numerical approach. I can uh, just add in, suppose I just add in one constraint, the error rate in the W basis. Then uh, I get this uh, dash curve here. But of course, so the rule is that the more constraints you add in, the higher your key rate will be. So I can also add in the error rate in the Z basis, and I get a higher bound. And, but then there's also the cross terms between Z and W. So I can add in, say, the first cross term. And then finally, I add in the last cross term, and I get a bound that looks like that. So obviously, um, we're doing much, much better than the uncertainty relation. Uh, so, so let me just explain this flat thing here. So the reason that it's flat is that you can think of Z and W as being tomographically complete in the plane in the sense that you can use these four constraints in order to calculate what the ideal phase error rate would be if you had measured X. Uh, but so what this plot illustrates is that our approach allows us to systematically study the effect of um, using more or less of your data for calculating the key rates. And uh, this also shows that data that you would normally discard in sifting, like these cross terms, are actually useful for giving higher key rates. Uh, so finally, I'll just mention that uh, all the protocols that I discussed previously um, can be thought of as entanglement-based protocols. But our approach um, generalizes to uh, prepare and measure protocols as well, where you just um, form from your signal states an entangled state. And then uh, the action of Eve is just on Bob's system, which means that Alice's reduced density operator is fixed here, independent of Eve's action. So in addition, so you can apply our approach to this, this density operator, row AB, and then you would just, um, in addition to the, norm, the usual constraints that you would have, you would add in the constraints on row A that, that fix the form of, of row A. So, and then also we've generalized our framework to protocols that allow for post-selection. For example, you might have sifting, or maybe you discard rounds when a photon is lost, or you may have a USD measurement. And the only tricky thing there is that we have to apply the key rate formula to the post-selected state, not the pre-selected state. And uh, that involves translating your experimental constraints, which are actually on row AB, into a sort of corresponding set of constraints on the post-selected state. And that involves some, some careful thought that, we, that we've thought about. Uh, but so my last protocol that I'm going to sh show you is the B92 protocol, and what's nice about that is that it uh, involves both prepare and measure and post-selection. Uh, that is, Alice sends one of two states, phi zero or phi one, related by an angle theta, uh, and Bob uh, measures either in the phi zero basis or the phi one basis. If he gets these outcomes, then he says inconclusive, and they discard the rounds. These outcomes he's, they keep, uh, and uh, we could write down a set of constraints. Um, this constraint fixes, helps to fix the form of row A, as I mentioned previously. And likewise, I have to specify the post-selection filter. But once I do that, I fix the post-selection filter and the uh, constraints, then I get key rates. So uh, this is the result of our numerics. And what's nice is that we get, um, all the, we get the dependence on theta as well as the dependence on the, the noise, P, the depolarizing noise. Um, and I'll just remark that uh, that our, our results compare favorably to the literature. We get higher key rates than previous uh, analytical approaches here. So uh, with that, I, can, uh, ho I hope I've convinced you that we now have a new tool. Um, and, and we're very excited about having this new tool because it allows us to potentially investigate a lot of protocols. Um, and so here's a list of some of the protocols that we're interested in, in studying. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very clear and okay. timely talk. Okay. Questions? investigate um, side channel attacks, how, how well have you to model then the EVE strategy, like detectors and so on? I guess you have to put all this in there to do your optimizations, right? So, uh, so there, uh, mm -hmm. for, so you're referring to, for example, I mentioned Trojan horse attacks on there. So, um, so there, 
we would want to uh, basically um, think of, so, so there it's just the inner products between uh, the signal states that uh, get modified by the fact that, uh, so basically we imagine that there's some coherent state that uh, interacts with, uh, with the source and then um, gets a, a phase applied to the coherent state conditioned on which, which state it is. So, um, and yeah, so we think it can be done. On the last slide, you mentioned the cow protocol. Uh, and so I was um, wondering, um, because I saw this, this whole technique is kind of, in some way, uh, an IID technique, so to uh, speak. Uh, so um, the fact that you now have this on your slide suggests that your technique is actually much more general. Or well, I, I mean, that? or could well, you, in, but in but particular, in blocks the question is, could you prove security against full uh, or general attacks, or would you need to make an assumption of that? The assumption that Nicola mentioned of collective attacks, for example. So the the thought would be that we would have uh, uh, blocks, and then perhaps like using a kind of definite argument, like uh, random permutations. Then you could uh, get a sort of I IID structure um, from random permutation of the blocks, something like this. So uh, so yeah, we would be looking at at blocks there. Um, Okay. Let's thank again okay. uh, the speaker. Thanks. Thanks.